Well, good day, curd nerds. Today we're making triple udder blue. So triple udder blue uh, was an inspiration by fellow curd nerd Patricia Gauchi. So she sent me through a recipe that I slightly modified and uh, it looks like it's turned out okay. So why triple udder blue? Well, that's because it's made from three different milks. So it's made from cow's milk, goat's milk and buffalo milk. So getting the three different types of milk may be difficult where you live. And look, I fully understand that. I did manage to pick up some good goat's milk from uh, our local supermarket that actually set occurred in uh, a couple of videos ago where I made the goat's milk cheddar. So with that knowledge under my belt, I decided to branch out and use other milks that I knew that I could source locally that would actually set a curd properly. So, Triple Udder Blue was born. Uh, so, I'm hoping for a nice, creamy, full flavoured blue cheese. And let's see how I went about and made Triple Udder Blue. So here are the milks that I'm using today. You can see I'm using cow, buffalo and goat's milk. So the ingredients for Triple Utter Blue are four liters or one gallon of cow's milk. I'm using pasteurized unhomogenized. Two liters or two quarts of goat's milk. Two liters or two quarts of water buffalo milk. You can substitute sheep's milk for this if you wish. One eighth of a teaspoon of MM100 culture. 1 8 of a teaspoon of Penicillium Roque 40. I'm using a mild variety. 1 quarter of a teaspoon or 1.25 milliliters of single strength rennet diluted in quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water. 1 quarter of a teaspoon or 1.25 mils of calcium chloride diluted in quarter of a cup of non-chlorinated water. And 3 tablespoons of non-iodized cheese salt. Now don't forget to sanitize all of your equipment beforehand. I boiled all of the stainless steel stuff. You can see that I'm pouring in the cow's milk there initially. Now the water buffalo milk. And then the goat's milk. No, there's no specific order. Just make sure you now bring the milk up to 32 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Just give it a quick stir. Just checking to make sure it's at the right temperature for the next stage. And yes, it is perfect. So we're now going to add the calcium chloride and give that a good stir. Now we're going to remove half a cup of the milk. Just putting that into a sanitized measuring cup there. cover up your milk while you do this next bit. Now we're going to add the Penicillium Roque 40 powder, the mold, to the half a cup of milk. Now I find this helps dissolve the Penicillium Roque 40 and allows it to be distributed through the milk a lot easier if you do this step first. So just give that a quick stir. and that will rehydrate. The Penicillium Roque 40 is notoriously hydrophobic, so it doesn't want to incorporate into the milk. So this way, by letting it rehydrate for five minutes, you'll easily be able to stir it into the milk. So next, add the Penicillium Roque 40 mixture into the milk and stir it through. Make 
sure you get it all out and give it a good stir. Now we're going to add the starter culture. So sprinkle the MM100 starter culture all over the surface of the milk. Cover it up and we're going to let that rehydrate for five minutes. Five minutes later, just give that a good stir and mix it well through the milk. Just cover that up and now we're going to allow the milk to ripen or acidify for 45 minutes. So 45 minutes later, just give it a quick stir to make sure any cream hasn't floated to the top, just incorporate that back into the milk. And now we're gonna add the liquid rennet solution. Make sure you don't stir for any more than one minute. Now I'm using the flocculation method today because I'm unsure of the setting time for all these different milks and it's the first time I've ever used this recipe. So still the milk with your spoon and place a sanitized plastic lid on top of the milk and start a stopwatch. So about eight minutes in, just give the lid a spin just to check for any resistance. We're trying to determine like that when the curds are set. So the point that the curds are set is known as the flocculation point. So now we can stop our stopwatch and it took 13 minutes and 8 seconds to get to the flo flocculation point. So we're going to multiply the time to flocculation by 4. It gives us a total, total curd set time of 52 minutes. So subtract the time that's already elapsed, which is 13 minutes. And the remaining time to set is 39 more minutes. So I'm setting a timer for 39 minutes. There we go. So to learn more about the flocculation method, you can watch this video up in the info card. So remove the plastic lid and then cover the pot back up again. So once your timer goes off, just check for a clean break. And that is absolutely perfect. So now we're going to cut the curd. I'm using my curd harp to cut the curds into 1.25 centimeter or half inch cubes. Now it's a very good curd set. I'm very pleased with it. So the horizontal's done with the curd harp and now the vertical's done with the curd knife. So trying to make the cubes as accurately the right size as possible. So I go one way and then perpendicular to that. There we go, perfect. So cover that and we're going to allow the cubes to uh, rest for five minutes to heal. So warm the curds now to 38 degrees Celsius, 100 Fahrenheit over the period of 30 minutes. And during that 30 minutes, we're going to stir continuously, just gently. So make sure if there are any big bits, uh, we cut them with the edge of the spoon. So at the end of that, we're just going to hold the temperature for 10 minutes after that stirring. Now we can remove the heat source. Just getting rid of the water in my water bath. And now we're going to drain the curd. So I'm just going to line the colander with a loose weaf cheesecloth that has been sanitized. And it's still a little bit damp. There we go. So 
So I'm going to pour the curds and whey through the colander. You can keep the whey if you want and make some very nice ricotta and make sure that the curds are now draining. Get all, get them all out. So cover the colander with a lid to keep it warm and we're going to allow the curds to drain for one hour. So during the one hour period we're going to break up the curds a couple of times just to assist with the draining. Just very rudimentary, don't go too crazy. So that's the first time, this is the second time. Just into large chunks. Okay, so after the hour has elapsed, we're now going to return the drain curds into the pot and break them up into thumbnail sized pieces. In commercial operations, there's a big tool called a peg mill that you could use to do this, but I'm not a commercial operation. Now we're going to add the salt, sprinkle that evenly over the curds. So it's quite salty this, it's about 2.7% uh, salt. Well, we're going to lose a bit of that during the draining. So mix the salt in well. Make sure not to squeeze the curds, you want to keep as much moisture in there as you can. Perfect. So line your basket with the cheesecloth and fill it with the curds. There we go. Just getting the last bits out of the pot. So just fold the clo excess cloth over and then top that with a follower. Now we're going to lightly press the cheese. This is one of the very few pressed blue cheeses I've made. So popping it into the spring press, popping the 50 pound spring underneath. And we're going to press at about 4.5 kilos or 10 pounds for 15 minutes. So it's a very light pressing. We're just trying to get the curds to consolidate into one single mass. There's 15 minutes on the clock. So 15 minutes later, we're just going to increase the pressure to about 15 pounds or 7 kilos for the next 15 minutes. So just tighten in the spring a little bit more. There's another 15 minutes on the clock. So now we can remove the cheese from the cheese press. It should have consolidated into a single mass with the rind loosely closed. There we go. So just be careful because this may break apart. So we're going to flip the cheese and then we're going to redress it. There we go. To gather up your cheesecloth and then pop that back into your basket. So just fold the excess over again. And then top that with the follower again. spring back on top and we're going to press it 15 kilograms or 33 pounds for the next eight hours only there we go so eight hours later we're going to remove the cheese from the press
So just remove it from the cheesecloth. I'm going to place it onto a sanitized mat. There it is. It's a little bit wonky. I don't think the follow was quite on straight, but it still looks nice nonetheless. Notice that the rind's not entirely closed, and that's fine because I want some of the blue mold to grow inside. So we're going to air dry it on a rack for two days at room temperature to make sure we turn that daily. And the rind should dry out sufficiently. There we go, two days later. So prepare a sanitized ripening box and place a damp cloth under the mat just using a J cloth or a chucks and that'll help uh, the humidity in the ripening box so I'm just going to weigh that to see what the final yield was so it's 1.185 kilograms or 2 pounds 10 ounces so that's about a 14.8 percent yield which is much higher than cow's milk alone So once the cheese is touch dry, we're going to place that into uh, or onto a clean mat into a ripening box. And we're going to put the lid on and we're going to ripen that at 13 degrees Celsius or 55 Fahrenheit at 85% humidity turning daily. So 10 days later, the cheese now has some blue mold on it. Remembering this is only a mild penicillium rate 40, so the Penicillium Rogue 40 activity is not as great as the normal strong variety that I use. We have both kinds at Little Green Workshops. So just taking that cheese out, leaving it on its mat. And I should have a light coating. As you can see there, there's a light blue coating all over the cheese. And it smells, well, bluey. There we go. Now we're going to take a sanitized thermometer probe and we're going to pierce the cheese through the top to the bottom. Uh, you can also use a knitting needle, not a very large knitting needle, but a knitting needle and that will work equally as well. Just make sure it's sanitized. Now I am going through the sides just a little bit as well to add a bit of oxygen in there, not too much because I didn't want the cheese to split apart. Traditionally, blue cheeses are stabbed into the side, but they're a lot taller than this one. So continue ripening at 13 Celsius, 55 Fahrenheit, turning it weekly for a total of 90 to 120 days. So 120 days later, so this is four months later. You can see it looks pretty funky on the outside. So there's blue mold, there's uh, white mold, a little bit of gray, which is the penicillium rogue 40 that's dead. Now the surface is quite dry. So we're gonna scrape the dry mold off with a flat knife and make sure you don't um, pierce the rind or anything. You'll find that when you're scraping, it's just scraping mold off the outside. The rind's usually fairly intact. Just clean your mess up as you go along. Now it doesn't stink overly of ammonia. There's a slight ammonia hint there, but as I did this, it dissipated. So there was no funky smell to the cheese. So don't forget to do the top and the bottom and do the sides as well and clean it up as best you can. Now this type of cheese is not usually eaten with the rind on. So you cut the rind off. There's the first glance at the inside. There's a bit of blue development in there. I didn't expect too much because we did press the cheese and didn't leave a lot of air gaps for the blue to develop. But there is some blue development, which is fantastic. And we'll see what that's like in the taste test. But first, let's prepare a piece for tasting. I'm gonna cut it into eighths. And we're going to make sure that this piece here, we're cutting the rind off top and bottom. The rind was a little bit dry, so I didn't want to taste that. And it had a little bit of funk on it, as you can see there. There we go. Just pre preparing the blue cheese for tasting. 
Anyway, back to Gav. Now, as you saw during the cutting video, uh, this cheese had been neglected in the cheese cave. Uh, you know, I've just come back from my back injury. It's still a bit sore, but I thought I'd give shooting this video a try. And I'm glad I did because after, what, six, maybe eight weeks of neglect in the cheese cave without turning it, without even checking on it because my mind was not in the cheese making space, this cheese looks like it's turned out fairly well. Now, it doesn't have as much blue as I had expected because I looked back at the video and noticed that yes, I did press it, therefore leaving out all the little pockets and fissures in the curds that would have allowed for, um, for blue vein development. So the only blue we've got is the lines, both horizontal and vertical. Uh, that have the blue. So there should be some blue flavour in there. Now the cheese turned out on one side to be very dry. Um, and where is that? This side. Hard as a rock. So I don't know how much cheese we'll be able to rescue off of that, but as I did with this piece here, cutting the rind seemed to work okay without too many issues. It looks like it's turned out to be a very creamy cheese, uh, even though this cheese has matured for quite a long time. And by a long time, I mean this was made on the 26th of April. Uh, it's now the 26th of August. So, May, June, July, August. So it's had four months in the, uh, in the maturation cave and hopefully it's turned out okay. So without further ado, any more waffling, let's try, I'll grab a cracker out of my cracker box. One that's not broken, if I can find one. They're all broken. No, that one's not broken. Right, there we go. So let's try a piece with a lot of blue development on it. Mmm. That is gorgeous. You're getting a little bit of goaty flavour, just a little bit. It's well salted, so the salt is just perfect. A um, little bit of blue flavour, of course. A lot of creaminess from the uh, buffalo milk, which is very high in fat, as is goat's milk. Mmm. That, as I say here in Australia, is going straight to the pool room. This is going straight to the pool room. That's a very good cheese. Um, yeah, I like the creaminess. A little bit firm on the outside, but that's because I cut the rind off. The rind was a little bit dry. But the inside of the cheese, absolutely perfect. A little bit nutty, just a little slightly, but I didn't add any propionic shimani to it or anything like that. Now I did use the mild blue um, mold, a penicillium roke 40 mold, which we have on our website. Uh, it's not as strong at proteolysis as the the stronger blue that I have. So it, there's a very subtle flavour, but the flavours are great because you've got the blue, you can taste a little bit of the goat, you've got the creaminess of the buffalo, and the well-balanced um, notes of the cow's milk. So, mm, this is perfect, lovely. Now, if the blue had grown a bit more, that would have been fantastic, but it didn't. But we still have some blue flavour in there, which is, which is spot on. Everything's really subtle about this cheese. The blue flavour's subtle, and all the other, um, you know, the milkiness from the cow's milk, the, the, the little bit of sharpness from the goat's milk, and the creaminess of the buffalo milk. It's all very rounded. It's a very well-rounded cheese. So... Final thoughts, if you can get your hands on three different kinds of milk, uh, then yeah, do yourself a favour and give it a go. Even if you use them in different ratios than I do in the video, give it a try. I'm sure you'll be very impressed with the outcome. It's a great cheese and it's great to be back. So, if you want to support the show and see 
more cheesy videos like this one, uh, you can pop over to Patreon and pledge your support or hit the join button down below. Uh, if you want to buy the products to make this cheese, the cultures and the, uh, the moulds uh, and the equipment as well, then pop over to littlegreenworkshops.com.au. Well, thanks for taking the time to watch it. If you enjoyed it or have any comments that you'd like to make about this cheese, then please do so below. Thanks for watching, Curd Nerds, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.